Hello, everyone. This is John Novak, Communications Director with Inspire. Uh, welcome to our webinar. I have the pleasure of being the moderator of today's webinar, Navigating New Treatment Options for Gastric Cancer, Reaching Above and Beyond the Standard of Care. This program comes to you from Inspire and from the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. We'd like to recognize Debbie's Dream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer, and No Stomach for Cancer, two great nonprofit patient advocacy organizations that are supporters of this webinar. We invite you to check out their websites. And additionally, visit Debbie's Dream Foundation's online support community here on Inspire. You'll see that link down on the lower left-hand corner. Before we begin, here are a few minor housekeeping items. Today's program is being recorded, so a link of the recording will be sent to everyone who's registered. So please check your email uh, in the next few days to get that link. The speakers on this program will answer questions toward the end. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time during this event using the question section on your control panel on the right-hand side. Please try to be as general as possible in your questions as the speakers cannot provide individual medical advice. Also, if you're having any technical issues, you can use the questions function in that control panel to let us, go, let us know, and we'll try to help you out. So without further ado, let's begin. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jeremy Davis. Dr. Davis, thanks for joining us today. My research focus and clinical interests are uh, gastric cancer. And I wanted to start with a little background on gastric cancer today. So for people's interest, and I think we're going to advance to the next slide, if possible. There we go. Stomach cancer is not very common in the United States. It may be hard to reach the average cancer. People probably know breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer are quite common in the United States. Stomach cancer, on the other hand, only affects about 28,000 people a year in the United States. So it's not common, but at the same time, it's a great health risk because stomach cancer is a, a cancer that presents oftentimes at later stages and uh, can be a little bit harder to treat for that reason. But worldwide, stomach cancer is quite common. So for that reason, research in stomach cancer not only helps patients around the world. Stomach cancer presents uh, oftentimes with very vague symptoms. Uh, people might experience things such as early satiety. They, they might also experience decreased appetite. Um, Nonspecific symptoms like bloating or abdominal pain uh, people may think are related to upset stomach, uh, acid reflux, things of that nature. Other uh, symptoms that are uh, not readily apparent sometimes to patients may be things like anemia or a low red blood cell count that may be found uh, on a regular checkup by your doctor. And then other things that can be confused with lots of other health problems include weight loss, heartburn, or indigestion. So for these reasons, stomach cancer is oftentimes not diagnosed until later stages because other things are, are presumed to be the cause of these problems uh, oftentimes in the beginning. Once people are found to have these symptoms and their uh, physician initiates a workup, oftentimes starting with a referral to a gastroenterologist for an endoscopy procedure, once this cancer is diagnosed, it's treated in a variety of ways, although the mainstay of treatment is surgery. Surgery is performed to remove the tumor that lies within the stomach. This surgery is combined usually with chemotherapy. This chemotherapy is given through an IV and can be given before surgery and after surgery, um, but often in combinations with surgery and not alone. Radiation therapy does play a role in the treatment of stomach cancer, but often uh, 
is a, uh, an addition to surgery and chemotherapy and usually not a standalone treatment. I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> so a lot of people probably want to know what are the challenges facing us today in the treatment of stomach cancer? As I pointed out before, surgery and chemotherapy have been the mainstay of treatment for stomach cancer for at least the last 20 years. Prior to that, it was mainly surgery alone. But the current obstacles to treatment uh, arise because gastric tumors are really heterogeneous. And, and what that means is that at the most basic molecular level, they're quite variable. Uh, in recent years, people have suggested that there may even be four or five distinct subtypes of stomach cancers. And what that means is that on the level of DNA of the tumor, um, these tumors look different and behave very differently and therefore are likely to respond to our different treatments such as surgery and chemotherapy uh, very differently. People have probably heard a lot in the last few years about precision medicine or precision therapy. Uh, what people are referring to is a sort of personalized medicine that means that the treatment that's chosen for any particular tumor is expected to disrupt the very unique pathways that are responsible for the growth and the spread of that particular tumor. So in the instance of stomach cancer, one good example is a, the current uh, approved therapy for advanced stomach cancer targeting the overexpression of a protein called HER2. Now many people may be familiar with this because it's quite common in breast cancer. And this uh, molecule that's present on the surface of cells is easily targetable with certain drugs and one of the most common is a drug called trastuzumab. In gastric cancer, a subset of stomach cancers, probably 20 to 25 percent, overexpress this protein, making it a prime target for so called precision therapy. But again, with only 20 to 25 percent of stomach cancers expressing this protein, it means that we have a long way to go in identifying uh, unique targets on uh, patients' individual tumors. Immunotherapy is, is quite a hot topic in cancer care these days, and as many people see uh, ads on the TV uh, or in the newspaper, immunotherapy, broadly speaking, is a therapy that stimulates or manipulates the patient's own immune system to destroy cancer. And there are certain features of, of tumors that make them more susceptible, we think, to immunotherapy. And one example from many, many years, or for many, many years, has been melanoma. And people have tried to expand what we know about melanoma to other cancers. So in the case of some stomach cancers and many other forms of cancer, there's a particular uh, protein that's expressed called PD-1 on tumors. And the antibody that targets this and disrupts this uh, interaction on tumors uh, uh, is very uh, effective in treating many tumor types. Melanoma is one. It's been approved for treatment in uh, kidney cancers and bladder cancers. And most recently, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for the the treatment of so-called MSI high tumors or microsatellite unstable tumors. And this is a really unique advancement in the treatment of cancer because it's a drug that's approved for the treatment of cancers regardless of type and uh, really approved based on what they look like under the microscope. Now in stomach cancer, about 20% of tumors are MSI high, meaning that a stomach cancer has about a 20% chance of having this phenotype or this look, meaning that it would be susceptible to pembrolizumab therapy. And that's a great advancement for patients with stomach cancer. We'll go to the next slide. There we go. So with those exciting advancements in precision therapy with anti-HER2 antibodies and with immunotherapy with anti-PD-1 antibodies, 
there still remain challenges and opportunities. The challenges, I think, involve early identification of patients, especially patients at highest risk for developing stomach cancer. We haven't talked much yet, and people may ask what are the major risk factors for stomach cancer. One of the ones we'll talk about today are hereditary factors, uh, such as gene mutations that are passed down uh, from, from family member to family member. This is an uncommon cause of stomach cancer. The other risk factors are largely environmental, and, and one of the highest risk factors is uh, infection with a bacteria called H. pylori. But if we can do a better job of identifying patients at early stage or at high risk, we, we can improve our treatment. We also want to be able to apply the results from genetic tests that are being done to help treat more patients. Many patients have probably heard about genetic testing on their tumor to identify these targets that I talked about uh, and, and apply what we know about precision medicine. But the truth is right now, so many of those genetic tests that are being performed uh, go um, uh, without being put to good use for patients. And we need to share that data and learn from that data as a community. And what are our opportunities going forward? Well, there are two, I think, especially. One is we'd like to encourage more patients to participate in clinical trials wherever they're getting treatment around the country. And that's because participating on a clinical trial means that every patient that gets treated, we learn as a medical community more and more about how to better treat tumors. And I also want to emphasize the value of expert and multidisciplinary treatment. I think it's very important, especially in the case of stomach cancer, for patients to be treated by a multidisciplinary team, a team that works well together and understands the unique challenges of taking care of patients with stomach cancer. So for now, I think I'll pause and I'll turn it over to Dr. Theo Heller, uh, who is a section chief of translational hepatology section uh, in the uh, liver diseases branch of the NIDDK at NIH. And then I'll be here later to answer more questions. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here to talk about something that means a lot to me and matters a lot to many patients. I want to thank everyone who helped organize this and put things together. I really appreciate all the work that went into this. And I want to thank all the patients who come and see us every day who allow us to do what we do and to learn from them. It makes a tremendous difference and that's how we innovate and create new treatments that will get into the clinic everywhere. I wanted to just go through one of the responses we developed so we talk about precision med medicine and innovative treatments, but how do you create a, a zone, a safe zone, or how do you create a, an environment which allows this innovation, and how do you bring together different people to really develop things? So the United States government, your tax dollars, has already done this. There's something called the NIH Clinical Center. It's the world's largest hospital exclusively for clinical investigation. There are over 1,600 clinical studies in progress right now. Half of them are natural history studies of rare diseases which are not studied anywhere else. And half are phase one and two, early therapies before they get out through the FDA, which are being developed here. We focus on innovative experimental treatments. There's no cost to any of the participants. But I think the thing that bears most emphasis, the thing that is most important to all of us, is that we provide state-of-the-art hospital care that the patient care is the single most important thing to us. It doesn't matter what the study demands or what the study wants, the patient has to come first. To further cone in or zoom down, specifically we've developed a clinical center for that team. We've developed a group of people from many specialties who specialize in diseases that occur in what we call the foregut. The foregut is a term that is derived from embryology or how we develop where, when we're in our mother's stomachs. And the foregut is the esophagus, the stomach, pancreas, liver and bile ducts, gallbladder, and the beginning of the small intestine. Stomach is often called gastric, so that's the term gastric cancer comes from that. And we brought together people and specialties who have interests and obsessions in these fields. This is a photograph of some of the members and a list of some of the specialties that we brought together. 
And you can see we even brought together operating room nurses, research nurses, radiation oncologists, pathologists, pain and palliative care, nutrition experts, as well as the expected specialties like surgery, gastroenterology, oncology, the kind of people you would expect to be involved. And I think by creating an integrated multidisciplinary team where we know each other, work together, like each other mostly, okay. and we trust each other, and we have enough of a relationship to criticize each other, to call each other out, we found that this really allows for a seamless cooperation and an integrated approach to cancer treatment that provides the highest quality care to patients through diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. And that is really our priority. As an example of something that we focused on here is robotic and minimally invasive surgery. There are benefits for the team and for the patients. For the team, there's greater visualization, dexterity, and precision. And for the patients, there's reduced pain and discomfort. I don't know why patients always care about that, but they do. There's shorter hospitalization, faster recovery, small incisions, reduced risk of infections, decreased blood loss, and less scarring. So this is an example of something that initially focused on some procedures, but since Dr. Davis arrived and other people with him, we've expanded robotic surgery to other types of surgery, abdominal surgeries that it traditionally was not done in. Through this team and through this integrated approach, we've tried to develop innovative clinical trials, broad screening protocols. So the broad screening protocols are important because when a patient comes to us, we don't yet know if they'll fit into a study or not, and we don't know if the study is in their best interest. So we want to be able to meet people and see and be honest with them about what's really appropriate for that patient, and then have the option of multiple trials. If we feel that standard of care therapy is what's best for you, we will tell you that. We see a wide range of patients. We have focused on new approaches to diagnosis, not just the innovative treatments. The collaboration is something that I've already emphasized, but I wanna go back to that because I think that that team environment is essential for state-of-the-art patient care. I don't think you can really develop state-of-the-art patient care unless you have a team, and that team includes even the person who cleans the floors. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, I mean that in the most sincere way. Because if you're not all in the same mission, mission, and you don't all have the vision of trying to cure disease, you don't work together. And the best results are obtained when you work together with the same vision. And for me, as on a personal level, that's been probably the most gratifying thing about practicing in this environment. Yes, it's cool to develop a new team, it's cool to work on new therapies and be at the cutting edge, but to work with people who have the same mission and who are as dedicated is extremely fulfilling. Oops, it went backwards. Okay, so for more information or to participate in a gastric cancer clinical study, there's a phone number there, there's an email there, and feel free to call or email. We're happy to review records and go from there. So next I would like to introduce one of our patients, David Fogel. He had he has he was born with a CDH1 gene mutation and he's going to tell you about his journey and how that led to him living without a stomach. David Thank you doctor and um I'd also like to thank everybody for allowing me to participate today and for putting this on. Um, really happy to be here and shed any kind of insight that I can. So uh, my name is David Fogel. I am an entrepreneur. I am a musician. I like to consider myself a citizen of the globe. Um, I'm an NIH Clinical Center patient, CDH1 gene mutant and a total gastrectomy survivor. So this is where it all begins, and this is not a picture of confetti. Um, this is, according to Wikipedia, a colorful photo of the CDH1 gene. Unfortunately, my colorful gene has a mutation which causes a condition called hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. 
or HDGC. People with HDGC have a high risk for a kind of stomach cancer called diffuse gastric cancer. In people who have a mutation in the CDH1 gene, the lifetime risk for diffuse gastric cancer is estimated to be 70 to 80 percent for men and 56 to 83 percent for women by the age of 80. Diffuse gastric cancer is uh, really hard to find at early stages because it does not form a noticeable tumor that can be easily seen with screening. For this reason, it is sometimes recommended that people like me with HDGC have their stomach removed before the cancer can form. So here's a little slice of my life. I'm 41 years old. I own a coffee shop record store called Bump and Grind in downtown Silver Spring, Maryland. I also curate and host uh, DJ and multimedia events throughout the DC area here. I manage a creative agency and took two co-working spaces. In the thick of it all of this are my two boys, Aiden and Leon, and my wife, Jessica. Around this time last year, a distant cousin in San Diego who happens to be a gastroenterologist was studying uh, the family tree and in particular this mutation. He found my dad and said, hey, we can't be certain because it was 15 years ago, but we think your sister, my aunt, had the CDH1 gene mutation, and you all should probably get tested to see if you have it as well. So my sister, myself, and my cousin uh, went to get tested. My father was 72, fine and healthy. I had been getting endoscopies regularly. I was fine and healthy. I honestly didn't think too deeply about the test, but the results came back, and amongst the three of us, I drew the short straw. To be honest, I was more annoyed with the news than I was upset. Um, I quickly accepted my new reality, which confirmed what my mother had been telling me my entire life, that I was one in 10 million. No, I, I honestly felt really lucky. I, I was lucky to be alive in 2016, to be alerted by a distant cousin of this potential, to be able to simply spit into a test tube and consequently have the opportunity to nip in the bud a cancer that had already devastated my family. Looking at this slide, while I do like the occasional thunderstorm, I elected to remove this obstacle and took the sunny road. My family and I talked, a lot of, uh, uh, talked to a lot of people about options and projections. Our doctors and specialists were very frank about the limitations of screening tools at their disposal and that the current recommendation is to have your stomach removed if you are over 20. I continued to get lots of tests that came back negative for cancer, and the biggest shock was learning that I didn't need a stomach to live a rather normal life. I thought I was going to get a sheep stomach or a pig stomach or something like that, but when they said, no, you're just gonna live without a stomach and there's no replacement, I was honestly shocked that that was even possible. Much to the chagrin of some specialists and members of my family, I gave myself eight months to prepare for the surgery. I needed to get some ducks in line, put on some weight and do some things before I gave up my stomach. My wife and I went out to a restaurant we'd wanted to go to for decades. I entered a pizza eating contest with some other bucket list things that I'd wanted to do for a while, but hadn't had the impetus to do or figured I might not ever be able to do again. I felt incredibly fortunate to be able to have everything done at NIH. I went in on a Tuesday for my Wednesday surgery and I was there for a week. Working with Dr. Davis and his team was comfortable, reassuring. I met twice with Dr. Davis and his team. We talked on the phone a couple times. And him and his team, they were always very accessible, responding to emails in 30 or 45 minutes. It, it made me feel special, which was nice. At NIH, nothing was being pushed on me. Everything was very transparent. Nothing ever felt rushed. It was a very different experience than what I had when I started going down this path with, with other hospitals and medical teams. 
The cherry on top, of course, is that hopefully my stomach will help in the understanding of the mutation, the, the triggers and all of these things. And the end result will be that by the time my boys are of age and should they have the mutation, that Dr. Davis and his team will simply have them walk through a TSA-like doorway, tell them they're fixed and send away. No pressure doctors. <laughs> uh, so this is me um, at NIH. That's me saying goodbye to my stomach, a little pre before surgery, and that's the robot um, and me under that blue tarp there. The day after, uh, this is me and uh, my wife, Jessica, my mother and my sister. I was up and walking several times, taking sips of water to make sure the pipe was okay. Sure, there was discomfort, and that's what they've got great pain medications for. Uh, I wouldn't say any part of the surgery has been debilitating. The most difficult part for me has been slowing down and changing my eating habits. I used to be what I call an inhaler. I'd inhale food about twice a day, or of a pecker. I have a watch that has an alarm that reminds me to eat. I'm constantly nibbling. I'm trying to make sure I get in enough calories and protein so that I don't up impersonating a marathon runner because then I'd have to start running and I don't like running. So this is my actual Thanksgiving dinner. Not bad, right? I mean, that's a pretty full plate of food. Um, and that's me stuffed like everybody and thankful after it. They say after surgery, most people lose at least 10% of their weight, some upwards of 20. I'm in the 10% group now. My current diet day typically consists of two scrambled eggs in the morning, a couple of cheese or peanut butter cracker sandwich thingies, shepherd's pie or chicken pot pie for lunch, a protein shake, and then a bit of salmon or chicken for dinner, and maybe some natural peanut butter and apples for dessert. I become a label reader, which I wasn't before because I can't have anything with added sugar. The rule of thumb is if sugar is listed as one of the first three ingredients, it's a no-no. Having said that, this may not be a lifelong thing. I may be able to have some cake or a cookie here and there and be okay. Time will, I guess, tell. Meanwhile, uh, I, I met a woman last week, and, you know, she was 2.5 years post-surgery, and she told me she can't eat pork anymore. You just never know, but I had bacon yesterday. My one piece of advice for anyone considering having the surgery is don't do it before Halloween, especially if you have young kids, because one of the greatest joys of parenthood with young kids is to be able once a year to send them out to do all the work and be able to reap the rewards as a parent. So that was tough. Anyway, I'm six weeks post-surgery now. Uh, I have lost 10% of my weight. The next couple weeks for me are about getting back to working shifts in my shop, opening up our second store, scouting locations for the next few, and overall living life from a new perspective with gratitude. I get to now focus on creating and ticking off a new set of to-do boxes and enjoying this new ride. While I look at where I am right now, I thought my life post-stomach removal would have been a lot more disrupted than it has been. While I don't have all the energy I had pre-surgery, it's coming. While I'm not able to blindly eat whatever is put in front of me, I'm able to eat and my options will grow. And the reality is, is that I'm eating a much better diet. I feel really fortunate to be alive in 2017. Given the progress of science, this was a decision that could only be made now. A lot of people are asking me if having a stomach removed has been transformational. And having your stomach removed is no doubt significant. Yes, I've been transformed. I don't have a stomach, right? It's a big decision. But taken in context, for me at least, it was a no-brainer. Going into the surgery, I wasn't anxious. I wasn't scared. I knew that while the surgery was long, about five hours, I was going to be open and have robots probing around inside of me, which was all wild and surreal. It wasn't inherently dangerous or life-threatening, and I was really comfortable with the team at NIH. Most important, though, despite life's challenges, life is amazing, and I want to experience a lot more of it. 
This journey for me and my family began with my aunt who passed away at the age of 56 about 15 years ago. Her son was 13. My grandmother passed away soon thereafter of a broken heart. While I'm not a religious person, I do believe that my aunt and grandmother have been with me, looking down at me during this entire process, so happy, so thankful, and cheering me on. So that's it for me. Now I'll turn it over to John Novak of Inspire. Thank you, David. I can imagine that your words really resonated with the patients and caregivers and clinicians on the call now. We really appreciate it. It's time to give everyone participating today uh, a chance to ask questions. Uh, a few have come in already and we're grateful to those and we'll tee them up right now, but uh, please, uh, so that we have plenty of time that we wanted to put aside for um, the three presenters to be able to uh, answer your questions in real time, um, type them in and we'll forward them as we can uh, as time allows to our speakers. Uh, we had a couple of questions that related to that, that I think uh, all three uh, speakers can take on, but David, uh, if you take a swing at this one first. Uh, we had a few questions that I'm gonna combine that are around at the point of diagnosis of gastric cancer, what should patients and caregivers be doing? Um, at the, well, I mean, just to be perfectly clear, I never had, I was never diagnosed as having gastric cancer. So this might be a better question for, for Dr. Davis. Um, okay. uh, I, well, I guess, I, I guess maybe then, uh, to, to, and again, I'm kind of combining a couple of questions. Um, speak about, I guess, beginning your journey where you had to learn a, a new language, uh, begin to interact and educate yourself. Um, so to, to, I guess, shape the question yeah. slightly for you yourself and then uh, the doctors can speak about it from diagnosis of, of uh, a gastric cancer. Sure. And I mean, it's, it's, it's an ongoing pursuit and most of it honestly goes over my head because I'm not a super scientific person. but. You know, for me, the process started with a geneticist and um, meeting with him uh, a couple of times. And I went with uh, my wife and and uh, my cousin, um, my sister went and, and uh, my mother. And it was really an initial broad discussion of what CDH1 meant, what this gastric cancer, diffuse gastric cancer was about. Um, and then coming back and, and getting test, making sure that I wanted to get tested for it as some people choose not to. Um, but I did. And then uh, I went back and it was very simple. I just spat in a test tube and they sent it off to a lab and then, um, they told me the results were in and had me come back to his office and, uh, we talked about my new reality and um, the typical paths forward. Um, from that point on, I started to reach out to different specialists in the area here in um, Maryland. And uh, that's how I ended up with uh, Dr. Davis and his team. And if I might, uh, uh, David, before the doctors uh, uh, address that question. We had another question just come in um, asking you specifically, uh, have you experienced reflux post-surgery? That is a great question because I had to buy a new bed. <laughs> yes, I did. And um, I now sleep, one of, one of my new realities is I sleep at an angle for the rest of my life. I got one of those, you know, beds that, that tilt up. Um, much to my wife's chagrin because it's harder to cuddle now. But um, yeah, this is a bit of the new reality. Uh, about two weeks after the surgery, um, two nights in a row, despite trying to prop myself up with pillows because we knew it, it, it might happen, I woke up in the middle of the night with pretty intense chest pain um, and um, uh, took, ended up taking like Pepsid or something like that, which, which calmed it down, which was great because it was quite painful. But after two nights in a row that, um, we actually talked to, I think I, I contacted Dr. Davis and, and, and his team and they suggested, yeah, I should probably look into getting a new bed. So we did that. 
Great. Uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Heller, um, at, at point of, of diagnosis or, or again the patients and caregivers learning this new language, what are some initial steps, whatever their treatment um, uh, pathway will take them? Insights on that? So, this is Theo Heller, I'm the gastroenterologist, and it's usually the gastroenterologist who diagnoses the cancer. So, we would do an endoscopy, we'd see something abnormal, we do biopsies, and then we'd have to wait for the biopsies to come back. That's probably the most difficult three or four days for the patient, waiting for the diagnosis. Often it's pretty clear, and if that's clear, I would tell the patient that it looks like, but we need to confirm. If it's not clear, we would say, I'm not sure. We need to see what the biopsy show. This is the hardest time, it's the anticipation. Once we know what we're dealing with, it's much easier because then you can make a plan and you can confront it. This is where it's important to keep your head. In my experience, some patients then go to Dr. Google, and I have to still say that my MD is worth more than your Dr. Google. I think that it's very hard to just rely on information that's out there. I would make sure that I go to reputable websites, reputable organizations, like the organizations involved in this webinar. I would make sure that I get my information from places that know what they're talking about. You want to, you do want to educate yourself. You do want to find out what resources you have, and you do want to know what's available to you. Your doctor should be your guide. The gastroenterologist should say to you, these are the surgeons I normally work with, these are the oncologists I normally work with, and then refer you in, the, in an appropriate way. What I mean by that is not saying to you that you don't have to stick to this doctor. Here are two, three names. Get a second opinion. Get a third opinion. I wouldn't go beyond that because I think once you really go beyond that, you overthink things and you can go crazy. Sometimes things are really pretty straightforward. And the second opinion is not to hear something that's different because the second opinion will say exactly the same as the first opinion. I think it is also important to have the right chemistry with your team. And it really is a team. You want to know if your doctors work together, talk to each other. And if you have the right team, even if the treatment is the same between two different teams, that's sometimes more important than the finesses or the nuances, differences between treatment. So, to summarize, sit tight during the time when it's not clear, the period of what seems like impending doom. Second, educate yourself in a sophisticated way, not, in, not randomly and not going through random chat rooms. Third, you are going to get involved with a team understand and get to know your team well and in most cases that's more important than the details of the therapy. Therapy is very important. You want to make sure that what you're getting is correct and legitimate and state-of-the-art. But I think most places would have access, most people, most physicians wouldn't steer you to something that's not appropriate. I think it's more about finding an integrated group and the right group for you. Understand that it's, a, understand, the last thing I would say is, understand gastric cancer is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So you have, to, you have to pace yourself, you have to walk in knowing that this is a journey and that it's not gonna end after the surgery, that it's not gonna end after you adjust to your new diet or your new bed, that it's gonna be ongoing, maybe lifelong, and that you have to pace yourself for ups and downs. The downs don't mean that there's failure or that things are falling apart, the downs are part of the normal journey and the normal course of events. That's why you need support. So the last thing I would say is make sure that you have support. We heard from David the importance and he showed you the, it's interesting to me that he showed you the pictures with his sister, mother and wife. I think that's very typical. People who do well have that kind of support. I think that's essential to doing well. Spoke about the medical team. I'd also speak about the other team. It doesn't have to be a wife or a mother, but someone who cares about you and someone who's involved with you and who would support you through the downs and share the ups with you. That's the answer. Great, thank you, Dr. Um, John Novak again from Inspire. We're getting lots of great questions in. I'm trying to organize them um, as much as possible. There's a couple of specific ones for David that I'll jump into right here that should be uh, fairly quick but, uh, and hopefully insightful. One was, David, did you go directly to the NIH doctors or did you get a referral? And the second question is, uh, are you on any prescribed or over-the-counter medications that you can share um, the information about? Yeah, so I 
was very lucky growing up here in uh, Montgomery County where you are probably four degrees of separation from some connection to NIH. Um, and uh, when my family came to the realization of, of my new reality and started talking to other friends, uh, one of our friends was able to find Dr. Davis and his team in this clinical trial and forwarded it to us and we reached out and literally I think within three or four days we were in the office meeting with everybody and, and talking things through. Um, so it was referred through a friend. Um, as far as uh, uh, supplements and um, drugs, I'm not taking, well, everything I'm taking you can buy through Amazon or, you know, and, um, yeah, via the Googles. Um, I have to take uh, two multivitamins and uh, three uh, calcium pills uh, every day. And that'll be for the rest of my life. And the way I kind of look at it is if those are the only two pills I'm taking for the rest of my life, uh, that'll be great. Great, thank you. Um, a question for the doctor. So uh, a few questions came in uh, around this topic. Um, can you speak about radiotherapy? Uh, the question is uh, specifically, isn't radiotherapy dangerous for abdominal cancers because there are organs that can get damaged? This is Jeremy Davis. So, you know, radiation uh, is not dangerous when it's applied uh, in the appropriate manner. And while it is true that radiation applied to the abdominal cavity has a potentially higher risk of affecting other organs, uh, specifically the intestine, um, radiation therapy for gastric cancer uh, has kind of mixed use uh, in the United States, I would, I would say. The standard uh, way that radiotherapy has been used for gastric cancer is based on a trial called the Intergroup Trial that was run uh, probably a good uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And that trial basically showed that patients who got surgery alone compared with surgery followed by radiotherapy, the patients who got the additional radiotherapy did better. Now, that's become a option for patients receiving treatment. I would argue that it's probably not the most common way patients are treated in this country. Radiation therapy tends to be reserved for tumors arising near the junction of the esophagus and the stomach, and certainly for esophageal cancers. And some people have tried to say that we should be treating stomach cancers more like esophageal cancers, and in some institutions have begun to apply radiotherapy, uh, oftentimes before surgery for stomach cancer, but it's not uh, hit the mainstream yet. It's still, uh, I would say, investigational. Uh, but to answer the question, radiotherapy is not dangerous. The real question is, is whether or not it helps and whether or not it should be used. And I think that's where having a conversation with your, uh, your treating physician, your surgeon, your medical oncologist, uh, that team that Dr. Heller talked about is important. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Uh, another question coming in that perhaps that you can pick up on, uh, Dr. Heller. Um, the question is, how effective is HIPEC, H-I-P-E-C, for those who may not be unfamiliar with, with that, uh, in minimizing peritoneal recurrence, and can it be used before surgery to minimize or eliminate undetected cancer cells? Yeah, so that's a great question. HIPEC stands for Heated Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy, and HIPEC was actually um, not developed at the NIH, but it was really championed at the NIH back in the 1980s. And, and the pioneer here uh, uh, really has become uh, kind of the poster child or the, the, the representative of HIPEC across the world. Now, HIPEC's been used for a lot of cancers and is used, uh, for instance, people may know uh, family members with ovarian cancer, HIPEC is uh, an approved therapy and is really uh, uh, probably one of the best therapies that people with ovarian cancer or advanced ovarian cancer receive. Now, when any anytime you have a therapy that works, people want to apply it to other cancers. Gastric cancer has been a little bit late to adopt HIPEC. However, people are using HIPEC. 
In fact, we have a trial here, uh, of which I'm the principal investigator at, at NIH, that's studying HIPEC for patients with diffuse type gastric cancers that have spread to the peritoneal cavity. Now, in that case, we're using it to treat known cancer cells that have already spread. The question was, can you use it to prevent their spread? Now, I really would like to run that trial. Uh, and it's actually a trial that I proposed a couple years ago here. But people are a little worried about using a therapy to prevent something until they've shown that it has some efficacy once you know that something is there, if that makes sense. So I think what needs to happen is we need to show that HIPEC has some efficacy in the advanced setting, which is ongoing now. In fact, I just did one yesterday here at NIH on a, on a, on a gentleman with gastric cancer. But until we do this, I think it's going to be difficult for some people to uh, apply this or want to apply this to patients without evidence that it's actually spread, you know, so-called prophylactic or preventative therapy. But I think that there will be a subset of patients that, that would benefit from that. We just aren't there yet, but those trials are ongoing, and NIH is a place that is quite interested in me in particular. Thank you. Uh, there, were, there were several questions that came in, and I guess I'll piggyback um, on, on your final part of your answer. Uh, if people aren't, people are asking if they aren't from the area, um, kind of like the how do you get to NIH? Um, yeah. I, I, will, I will tell the attendees that the final slide will have some information uh, specifically to that, but um, I guess in general to, to, to answer for, for perhaps Dr. Heller to answer that. Kind of like, how do you get to NIH? There are a number of ways to get here. All, ro the number, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> you can go onto the website and you can look up contact information, email addresses, and uh, phone numbers. You can go to the Office of Patient Recruitment. The slide is up there right now, 1-800-411-1222. And there's an email there as well, prpl at mail.cc.nih.gov. In addition, the, perhaps a, the traditional route is that your doctor can refer you. Your doctor has a way of referring you and sending your records directly to one of us. And those would be the easiest, simplest ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, back, back to some of the clinically oriented questions, if I might. Um, here's one that come in. Once irritated scar tissue in your stomach is verified from a biopsy, does that make someone more susceptible to stomach cancer? Um, I guess I'm a little unclear about what they might mean by irritated scar tissue. But let's say that somebody has an upper endoscopy because of an upset stomach or kind of symptoms of heartburn. And the gastroenterologist, like Dr. Heller, performs the endoscopy and performs area of biopsy. As long as those biopsies don't come back showing some form of abnormal growth, and we would call that neoplasia or even dysplasia, um, and maybe even metaplasia, depending on, 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 on where you live in the world, for instance, the biopsy itself doesn't put you at greater risk. And, and biopsies showing um, benign findings don't necessarily put you at increased risk. So for instance, people that have gastritis or inflammation of the lining of the stomach or stress ulcers of the stomach aren't necessarily at increased risk. The things that we know put people at increased risk are things like H. pylori infection, which most pathologists will reflexively test for in any gastric biopsy. If you have that uh, bacteria, it should be treated, and then verification of treatment, eradication of that bacteria should be performed. You know, other risk factors are common across other cancers, smoking and heavy alcohol use. Uh, but uh, with regard to biopsies showing some sort of irritation um, or inflammation aren't necessarily, or in and of themselves, risk factors for developing stomach cancer. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions for David, but before we get to those, um, 
Another question came in related, to, uh, a few have come in around genetic testing. The question specifically is, do you have to see a specific doctor for genetic testing, or could it just be your primary care doctor? So that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, David mentioned that his first visit was really with a genetics counselor. And in fact, part of our team here, we, we work with excellent genetic counselors um, uh, at NIH. I think it's important, and I know that the genetic counselors out there would, would feel the same way, that any patient considering any genetic testing should meet with a genetics counselor. And the reason is, is that the genetics counselor is trained to assess risk in a patient by getting detailed information about family history and to explain that risk uh, in terms that, that patients can really understand. And as much as physicians learn about genetic uh, diseases or inherited diseases when they're in training in medical school or after medical school or in practice, they oftentimes don't have the same skill set that a genetics counselor does. And I would strongly advocate that any patient considering genetic testing certainly discuss that with their physician, but really they also need to meet with a genetics counselor. Uh, there are definitely um, resources um, on the web, probably available through websites like No Stomach for Cancer and others at NIH. Um, or, or through the NCI uh, to, to, to remind patients of the importance of, of discussing genetic risk with a trained professional. Thank you. Uh, another question that just came in um, as you were speaking, have there been any pharma, pharmacogenome, pharmacogenomic testing done for common PGX genes? Wait, what, what was the last part of that? For common what genes? PGX genes. I'm not. I, they may have to you know, clarify that for me. But I will okay. say this: that pharmacogenomics in general, there are certain drugs or chemotherapy agents out there um, that that we know uh, rely on certain enzymes in the body. And patients that don't have those enzymes or have certain genetic mutations called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms can respond differently to drugs. So for gastric cancer, I would say that there is nothing out there that we know of that would lend us to do specific pharmacogenomic testing with the exception of the common care chemotherapeutic agents that are used currently. They are usually things like uh, 5 fluorouracil, otherwise known as 5 FU, uh, leucovorin, oxaliplatin, and now taxanes. Um, I think when, when this person said PGX, they were talking about pharmacogenomics and PGX as a, as a, um, a, as a reference to pharmacogenomics. Correct. They did clarify that. Yeah. Another question uh, came in, and again, David, will round back around to you. But um, a question came in about collaborating with other centers of excellence uh, in the states and elsewhere. The question specifically is: um, Is the NIH collaborating with other centers of excellence, such as uh, MSK and MD Anderson? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think uh, there there is interaction. Um, I actually uh, did my training at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, and and I have a a, col a good colleague at MD Anderson that I uh, um, work with and and discussed uh, even our our HIPEC protocol because he has similar interests. So the truth is, yes, there's a lot of collaboration. What I would tell you is, is that there's still a long way to go in terms of sharing uh, data, uh, sharing tissue. Um, these are things that people may see coming out of the office of the director of NIH uh, and, and, and things related to the cancer moonshot about sharing data across all institutions, making data that come from clinical trials more readily available for all investigators. And I think we all could do a better job of working together um, and, and sharing information, working collaboratively. We're fortunate that at the NIH, uh, by virtue of um, 
of our position that that we we do interact and collaborate uh, very much so with other groups but that may not be true everywhere and that's something that we have to improve upon great thank you for that a uh, question back uh, for David uh, again when we cognizant that you're six weeks out uh, but question uh, we had a couple questions come in kind of around um, your diet lifestyle um, so with a relatively small sampling uh, a simple question around what what are you eating for, uh, drinking for breakfast lunch and dinner so as far as uh, fluids are concerned um, I initially was really into diluted cranberry juice, um, which I got here at, at the hospital. Um, but predominantly, it's uh, water. I do own a coffee shop, and I have started to be able to drink coffee again, um, which is wonderful. Um, I've been doing some teas as well, um, and I do uh, protein shakes, um, which really... Uh, helps ensure that I get uh, the nutrients and, and protein, daily allotment of protein uh, every day. Um, I also found it really helpful to download an app that would help me uh, track my caloric and protein intake. Um, so if anybody's going through this process, uh, I'd really recommend finding one of those as well. No whiskey or wine yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you. We're, uh, that, that, this hour went very quickly. Uh, we're coming up on time. Uh, any final thoughts from you guys in, in, in just a real, a, a real brief before we wrap? I would say don't be scared. I, this is Theo Heller. I would say that the ostrich that puts its head into the sand will still get eaten by the lion. And it's better to confront things. I think that confronting things, getting people around you, supporting you, both your team and your personal support, will help you get through this. I, I think better to confront it, make a plan, than run away from it. The Nile is a river in Egypt, and that's not helpful. Yeah, I would just echo uh, a thousand percent. I mean, um, I, I thought this was going to be much more of a life-altering thing for me. And um, so far, I, I feel like I'm over the worst part of it. And um, so far, I would definitely say that it really has not been that disruptive. Um, if anything, it certainly slowed me down for a couple months, which has honestly probably been good. And um, I've got a new diet now, which is more healthy. And I, I feel really, really fortunate to have been given this opportunity. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, we're glad that you could join us for today's webinar. Thanks again to the NIH Clinical Center, to our three great speakers, and uh, to our two supporting organizations, uh, Debbie Stream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer, and also No Stomach for Cancer. And we invite you to uh, check out the online community uh, on Inspire, uh, supported by Debbie Stream Foundation. And in closing, uh, as it's been up here, here's that information again about the NIH Office of Patient Recruitment for those of you interested in learning more about that office. Uh, for, the, for all you attendees, uh, please check your email within a few days. Uh, we'll send you a link to the recording of today's webinar. Feel free to send comments, questions, um, future topics to us at partner at inspire.com. That's P-A-R-T-N-E-R at inspire.com. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.